The first item of business is portfolio questions. Uh, I would appreciate succinct questions and answers, please. Question number one on education and skills is Ruth Maguire. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the implementation of its play strategy. Marie Todd. Scotland's national play strategy was developed in collaboration with the play sector, and this year alone we have invested over three million in this area. And this includes our continuing support for Play Scotland. Play Scotland continues to develop and distribute excellent resources and training for pra practitioners, teachers and parents to support the play strategy. This includes the Play Types Toolkit, which highlights the range of types of play children experience and the vital contribution that play makes towards their learning and development. Ruth Maguire. Thank the Minister for that answer. She clearly, given that, she would agree with me that Play Scotland has a central role to play in the continued implementation of the strategy. Will she agree to meet with myself and Play Scotland to discuss some current issues to play, such as how is weather, weather is used as an excuse not to go outside, withholding of play due to negative behaviour and some schools banning running in the playground? Marie Todd. Absolutely, I'd be more, more than delighted to meet with you in Play Scotland um, to, to discuss those issues. Um, I think we all enjoyed last week watching the children of Scotland building igloos all around the country. Um, I'm not sure that the weather should be uh, an excuse for not going outside. Um, there are undoubtedly issues around safety and a, and a risk assessment and a good decision needs to be made um, on these issues, but um, in general, it shouldn't prohibit playing outside or running. Supplementary from Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And I absolutely agree that uh, early access to play is essential for both physical and the mental well being and development of our children. I read through the National Play Strategy, which has some great visions and objectives, and I wholeheartedly agree with them. However, I found it quite light on the delivery programme. So, can I ask the government how it will practically deliver to the ambitions of the strategy? Marie Todd. <coughs> Um, as you know, the significant expansion of funded ELC gives us an opportunity to define the type of experience that we offer. And I spoke in the chamber last week about the fantastic visit I had to the Forest Kindergarten. We know the benefits of outdoor learning for children in terms of their health, their well-being, and their physical and mental development. There's a real growing body of research and evidence, and we're determined that that will be a key part of our offering going forward. Question number two has been withdrawn. Number three, Peter Chapman. To, to ask the Scottish Government what action is it taking to encourage young people into STEM apprenticeships? Jamie Hepburn. Uh, central to our developing the young workforce strategy is a commitment to prioritise and further expand STEM apprenticeship opportunities. Uh, recent publication of Scotland's STEM strategy for education and training makes a commitment to the planned expansion of STEM related foundation apprenticeships for pupils in the senior phase of school and graduate apprenticeships for those. Uh, who, uh, working and studying for degree qualification which provide clear pathways in STEM related work based learning qualifications. Peter Chapman. I thank the Minister for that uh, response. But for the current 2016 to 18 cohort, foundation apprenticeships are being delivered in just 23 of the 32 local authorities. And with just 251 STEM starts over that entire time frame, and with this being National Apprenticeship Week, can the Minister outline what he is doing to ensure all school-aged students will have access to studying STEM foundation apprenticeships if they want to? Jamie Hepburn. It, well, as the member will appreciate, foundation apprenticeships are a, a relatively new uh, creation. We have been uh, road testing and uh, rolling them out uh, further still. So we've uh, gone from a position of, in 2014 we had two Pathfinder uh, frameworks being delivered in two local authorities to uh, this year in 2018, we'll, we'll be providing opportunity to over uh, 2,000 uh, young people across Scotland to have the opportunity to take part in a foundation apprenticeship delivered in all 32 local authority areas. So he can be uh, assured that uh, we take uh, the role of development and expansion of foundation apprenticeships very seriously. We've made a commitment uh, that there will be uh, 5,000 such uh, opportunities uh, from uh, 2019 onwards. So we are continuing to grow that offer and I can assure uh, the member that STEM is a critically important part of that offering. Supplementary from Mary Fee. Thank you. Cutting over 800 STEM, te STEM teachers will not help promote opportunities in STEM to young people, especially those from the most disadvantaged backgrounds. 
What specific action is the Scottish Government taking to support children and young people from our most deprived communities to enter STEM apprenticeships? Jamie Hepburn. Well, of course, I've just made the point that we are uh, rolling out uh, foundation apprenticeships uh, more widely, so their wider availability uh, will ensure that more young people uh, have that uh, opportunity to, to take part, uh, specifically for uh, ensuring that we have uh, greater diversity of those taking part in uh, in STEM careers and STEM apprenticeships. That's something that we take very seriously. We're taking forward through a range of initiatives. We see that Skills Development Scotland work with the partners at a, a local level to ensure that there's greater uptake of foundation apprenticeships and STEM-related opportunities. And of course, ensuring that, that, that those from deprived backgrounds can get that opportunity is, is crit of critical importance as we ensure that more people can get that opportunity. Question number four, Jackie Bailey. To ask the Scottish Government what the average school clothing grant payment was in 2017. John Swinney. So local authorities spent £9.2 million on school clothing grants in 2016-17, although the level paid varies across local authorities. I'm determined to help families with the cost of the school day and I'm working closely and constructively with local authorities on the provision of a minimum school clothing grant. Jackie Bailey. I welcome that response from the Cabinet Secretary. He did, of course, agree to work with COSLA to produce a minimum payment um, in 2016, but we haven't seen evidence of that brought forward yet. And I, I am concerned because just this week at Western Bartonshire Council, the SNP had considered reducing the school clothing grant to £50. Thankfully, they didn't. The Labour Group proposed an increase to £130. And of course, the Cabinet Secretary will be aware that the Poverty Truth Commission say that the true cost of kitting out a child for school is indeed that £130. I wonder whether he would consider that as the appropriate minimum figure for all local authorities in Scotland. John Swinney. Obviously, there have been discussions within local authorities about the uh, level of the school clothing grant. Um, Jackie Bailey cites the um, proposals that were considered in Western Bartonshire. Uh, I noticed that in the city of Glasgow, which is um, obviously a very large local authority, uh, controlled for the first time ever by the Scottish National Party, that the school clothing grant increased from £52 to £70, which is very welcome. And after all these years when the Labour Party could have done something about this issue. So uh, very welcome progress has been made by uh, the administration in Glasgow City Council. Now, to, be, um, to give Jackie Bailey the assurance that she is seeking, uh, I had a very constructive meeting a couple of weeks ago with Councillor Stephen McCabe of COSLA, and we are undertaking joint work to establish um, an agreed approach to a minimum school clothing grant uh, for all local authorities within Scotland. Uh, that work is underway actively just now. Uh, I very much welcome the collaboration that we have with COSLA on this question. And as soon as we have reached the conclusion of that work, I will, of course, report to Parliament. Question number five, Gail Ross. To ask the Scottish Government how it supports school staff who provide guidance and counselling to vulnerable young people. John Swinney. Presenting officer, uh, the mental health of children and adolescent young people is a very important issue that we must all take seriously. We know that prevention and early intervention make a big difference in reducing the risk of developing mental health problems. Every child and young person should have access to emotional and well-being support in school. Some schools will provide access to school-based counselling, while others will be supported by pastoral care staff and liaise with the educational psychological services, family and health services for special support when required. A mental health link person is available to every school and this has been achieved in a variety of ways using models working to meet local needs. Gail Ross. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer. We are becoming more and more aware that preventing adverse childhood experiences or ACEs is fundamental to the well-being of children and young people. But where we can't prevent them, how can we make sure that all teaching staff can identify and nurture vulnerable young people and help build resilience and the ability to cope with trauma and adversity in these youngsters? John Swinney. There are two points I would make here, presiding officer, in relation to the questions raised by Gail Ross. The first is in relation to the application of professional practice in relation to adverse childhood experiences and the wider application right across our public services. 
uh, there will be, uh, uh, over the course of the last few months, many of us have seen the Resilience film, which focuses on adverse childhood experiences. And the rising out of a showing of that film, in which, which I hosted at St Andrew's House, the government will be hosting later on this month an extensive dialogue involving ministers, a range of ministers, um, our local authority partners, and a, a, a huge cross-section of stakeholders to find the ways in which we can apply best practice around tackling uh, adverse childhood experiences across the country. The second point I would make is very practically about the education system, whereby Education Scotland has developed two national professional learning resources, nurturing approaches in the primary school and a whole school nurturing approach, um, encourage the focus on creating a, an environment that is anchored around the principle of nurture and that that creates a supportive atmosphere and environment for children and young people to ensure that we can take all the steps we can possibly take to intervene at the earliest possible opportunity to avoid any mental health difficulties arising for young people. Ian Gray. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, President Officer. In England and in Wales, pupils have a legal right of access to a trained and qualified counsellor at school if needed. Is that not a right our children could benefit from too? John Swinney. I, I think the, the most important thing is to make sure that young people have access to the services that they require. And I set out in my original answer to Gail Ross the range of support services that are available. And of course, uh, there is a mental health link person available to every school um, de uh, deployed in different ways around the country. So the vital issue we have to focus on is making sure that young people have access to that support, to have the ability to intervene as early as possible. And of course, Early intervention can avoid the escalation of some of these issues and as a consequence deliver a much more sustainable solution for young people around the country. And that's exactly what the government will focus on doing to make sure we meet the mental health needs of all young people in Scotland. Question number six, Liam MacArthur. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what it sees as the key roles of uh, student associations in representing the interests of students at colleges and universities. Shirley Ann Somerville. Student associations play a vital role in the learning and lives of college and university students and it is important that students be given the opportunity to express their views on issues of concern to them. Recognising this, the Higher Education Governance Scotland Act 2016 sets out that membership of the governing body within a higher education institution must include two student members nominated by a student's association of that institution. Students also have representation on boards in the college sector with the Post-16 Education Scotland Act 2013, increasing the minimum number of student members on college boards to two. The Scottish Funding Council currently fund NUS Scotland to support colleges and their students' associations to deliver on the key aims and objectives set out in the framework for the development of strong and effective college student associations in Scotland. Liam MacArthur. Can I thank the Minister for her uh, response? Last week I visited uh, Inverness College, where I was hosted by the Highlands and Islands Student Association, uh, who have enjoyed, I think, tremendous success in a relatively short period of time in giving students across the University of the Highlands and Islands a strong and effective uh, voice. But during the discussions with HISA reps, including the team at Orkney College, concerns were raised about costs of attending events and meetings invariably taking place in the central belt. So in light of the comments from the Minister in relation to the funding that's provided, could she look at whether or not there are still barriers, cost barriers, uh, to be overcome in allowing students right across the field uh, to, provide, to pr provide that representative role on behalf of their peer group? And can she also look at ways in which perhaps events could be encouraged to take place out with uh, the central belt, uh, benefiting uh, those in the Highlands and Islands, the North and indeed the South? Shirley Ann Somerville. I'm, I'm unsure um, to, uh, to the, the detail of what events are, are being um, um, highlighted by um, Liam MacArthur, whether they're Scottish Government, Funding Council or NUS events, but I'm happy to take on board, certainly from a Government and Funding Council um, direction, that we need to, to look at that when, when um, we are um, collaborating with, with students from and across the country and indeed using digital technology where, where that's um, appropriate. So I would certainly um, take that on board and, and encourage others um, to do so. It is very, very um, important that um, um, students from UHI can collaborate and share their experiences. Um, I've had uh, now quite a, a few dealings with 
um, the students at different UHI campuses and see how well that they work together. But undoubtedly, the challenges that they also face, given the unique nature of, of UHI. So um, hopefully, Mr MacArthur can be assured that the Scottish Funding Council is um, receiving feedback from associations. Indeed, they received that last year about the positive impact that college students associations are, are making. And we have an ongoing commitment to ensure that we share best practice as that goes along. And if that's not happening, then the Funding Council will work with the college and the students to ensure that's happening. But if there are specifics um, that uh, the member would like me to look into further, I'd be happy to do that. Question number seven, John McAlpin. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what evaluation is carried out of how Scottish study strand of the curriculum is operating. John Swinney. General Officer, while there has been no formal evaluation of the Scottish study strand of the curriculum as a whole, Education Scotland's evaluation, evaluation report on literacy in the curriculum, published in 2015, found that teachers were increasingly using Scots and Scottish text to develop children's literacy skills. This was followed by Education Scotland's report into Scots in the Curriculum, published in August 2017, that confirmed the educational benefit of learning Scots. The Scottish Studies Awards were introduced in 2013-14. There has been an increase in the uptake of them across all SCQF levels, rising from 165 awards in 2014 to 1,383 in 2017. John McAlpin. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. In 2011, the Government set up an independent working group, including highly respected cultural leaders such as Phil Cunningham, Liz Lockhead and the late Gavin Wallace, to advise on how best to implement its manifesto commitment to roll out Scottish studies in a meaningful way across the curriculum. That review group made a number of specific recommendations, including on continuing professional development, signposting and generally supporting a positive environment for schools engaging in learning about Scotland. Can the government tell us which of the working group's recommendations have yet to be implemented and whether implementation is consistent across schools and local authorities? John Swinney. I, I, I'll have to write to Mr McAlpine about the, the detail of a rec, a implementation of the individual recommendations. What I would say at the outset is that, of course, there will be um, a variety of different approaches taken to the application of uh, this aspect of the curriculum within different schools, as should be the case, because mm -hmm. curriculum for excellence uh, relies upon the, um, the judgment of individual teachers to deploy the curriculum in the most effective way to meet the needs of young people. Um, the recommendations from the Scottish Studies Working Group um, have been embedded across the curriculum. I can give that assurance, and uh, schools will be able to develop their practice to uh, reflect uh, the steps that have been taken. Education Scotland and the Qualifications Authority provide materials and resources to support schools and teachers to include Scottish studies in the curriculum and to actively promote studying Scotland and the Scottish Studies Award to teachers and to schools to ensure that the increase in uptake that I talked about in my first answer is something that's capable of being delivered by the education system. Supplementary, Liz Smith. Uh, thank you. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, on the same Scottish theme, could I ask you how many pupils across Scotland are taking up the Scottish Baccalaureate qualification? John Spinney. I, I, I don't have that uh, number to hand, but I'm certainly happy to, to write to Liz Smith on that question. Um, what, what I can say is that, of course, we have a broad range of qualification opportunities avail available for young people, a broadening range of those qualifications, and indeed, uh, my attendance just a couple of weeks ago at the Scottish Credit and Qualifications Framework uh, Conference, I was enormously heartened by the strength of that framework and the breadth of the curricular and qualification opportunities that are available for young people to recognise all aspects of their learning and to use that as a foundation for future success. Question number eight, Alex Cole-Hamilton. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what impact its most recent teacher recruitment campaign has had. John Swinney. Thank you, the Scottish Government's Teaching Makes People campaign was launched in February 2017 and has led to almost 3,500 people attending Teaching Makes People events and over 42,000 visits to the website. Campaign tracking showed a 21% increase in those considering applying for a postgraduate diploma in education and that 40% of people who had seen the campaign took action, such as seeking advice on a career in teaching. A further phase of campaign activity was completed at the end of February and is currently being evaluated. 
Information received from universities for recruitment into initial teacher education showed a 7.5% increase in student teacher numbers from 3,591 in 2016 to 3,861 in 2017. And of course, the number of teachers in Scotland rose by 543 in 2017, including a rise here in Edinburgh, the third year in a row we have seen a rise in the number of teachers. Alex Cole Hamilton. I'm grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Last week, I was contacted by Gail Morrison, who's a constituent of mine with a son at Queen's Ferry High. She told me that the computing science teacher left last month and has not been replaced. She was the only such teacher at the school, so all computing classes are currently going without. The measures adopted by the school include pupils following a set of PowerPoint lesson plans themselves under the supervision of a history teacher. So will the Cabinet the Secretary explain to Gail how he expects pupils to attain these vital qualifications if there is nobody there to explain coursework to them when they get stuck? John Swinney. Presiding officer, I'm the first to acknowledge, and I have acknowledged it on a number of occasions, the challenges that we face in the recruitment of individual teachers into particular subjects uh, across the country, and there are acute challenges within the STEM subjects. It's for that reason that the government has taken steps to increase the number of STEM recruits that are uh, recruited into our um, education system. And uh, I announced on 8th of October that a scheme for STEM bursaries would be created, which would enable individuals to access £20,000 of funding to essentially make a career switch uh, from existing uh, activities into teaching. Uh, I'm pleased to uh, tell Parliament today that applications for the STEM bursary will be available to be completed on the 3rd of April, and that will be available to individuals to fill some of the vacancies that Mr Cole Hamilton raised in his question. Supplementary to Finlay Carson. Thank you. Since uh, 2010, Dumfries and Galloway has seen a 16% decline in STEM teachers in secondary schools. With the newly created Fast Track Teacher Route focusing on other rural areas, can the Cabinet Secretary say what action is being taken to address the specific STEM recruitment issues facing Dumfries and Galloway? John Swinney. Well, there are, of course, a number of steps that have been taken. There's the STEM bursaries that I've just referred to, presiding officer, which are there to open up the opportunities for individuals to come to enter the teaching profession. Uh, we have, of course, expanded the available places for individuals to gain access to initial teacher education. Uh, there were over 4,000 places available for uh, this current academic year. And as a consequence of the new routes into teaching that uh, the government has established, over 250 teachers have been recruited into initial teacher or candidates have been recruited into initial teacher education that would not have been able to gain access had it not been for the steps that we had taken. Now, Mr. Carson is correct that the government is opening up uh, opportunities for particular rural areas in the partnership between the University of the Highlands and Islands and the University of Dundee to try to take forward steps to attract more STEM teachers and that will assist the general um, flow of teachers into the teaching profession as a consequence of the steps that the government is taking. Question number nine, Stuart McMillan. I to ask the Scottish Government what support it is giving to registered child minders. Marie Todd. Presiding officer, we recognise the valuable contribution that ch child minders can and do make to delivering high quality early learning and childcare for many families. We want to see more childminders involved in delivering funded early learning and childcare. The introduction of our provider neutral funding follows the child approach will support childminders across Scotland who wish to do so to offer the funded entitlement to families. We provide grant funding to the Scottish Childminding Association to enable them to support and actively promote childminding services. This grant funding enables provision of induction training, access to legal advice, business support, advertising and an advice helpline for its members. We recently also funded the Care Inspectorate to develop Your Childminding Journey, a learning and development resource. This resource has been warmly welcomed by childminders and provides support for new childminders as well as personal development material for existing childminders. Stuart McMillan. I thank the Minister for that reply. And the Inverclyde has 54 registered childminders working with 411 children and supporting 310 families. Clearly, childminding plays a crucial role in my constituency. But how does the Scottish Government consider childminding playing a role in delivering the 11,040 free hours policy 
and sometimes local training will regularly take place after nurseries close for the day, whilst childminders will regularly work until after 6 p.m. Therefore, they are prevented from attending. Marie Todd. We expect childminders to play a full role in the expanded early learning childcare sector. We work closely with the Scottish Childminding Association in developing our quality action plan for the ALC sector. And one of the actions included in that plan was to make available to all ELC practitioners, including childminders, a national online programme of continuing professional learning that can be undertaken at a time that's convenient to them. In September 2017, the Care Inspectorate published My Childminding Journey, which is a learning resource specifically for childminders, which helps to guide them through their induction and in professional learning once in practice. Again, this can be accessed at their convenience. The SEMA regularly run courses on weekends specifically to ensure attendance for those who work out with regular hours. Supplementary to Michelle Ballantyne. Thank you. Um, thank you for those responses. However, the Scottish Government has said it will go to greater efforts to involve childminders in the expansion to 1140 hours. However, as recently as November, the Scottish Childminding Association have said that only 100 out of the 6,000 childminders in Scotland are actually commissioned by local authorities to deliver funded childcare. So can you tell me what steps is the Scottish Government going to take or has taken towards increasing this figure of getting childminders onto the partner provider lists? Marie Todd. Through our review of the local authority ELC expansion plans and in response to the latest figures produced by the Scottish Childminding Association on the current use of childminders in providing funded ELC, we have committed to working with local authorities, SCMA and individual childminders to identify any barriers to commissioning childminding services. We'll work together and remove those barriers, building on learning from the national programme of 1140-hour trials. Of the 14 Scottish Government 1140-hour trials, 10 of them involve childminders. Question number 10, Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what consideration it gives to the provision of teaching life skills as part of the school curriculum. John Swinney. Sorry, officer, our curriculum has always been about providing young people with a well-rounded education that prepares them to thrive in today's world. The teaching of life skills is an entitlement for all learners under Scotland's curriculum. Curriculum for Excellence is explicit in stating that all learners must have opportunities to develop skills for life, skills for learning and skills for work with a continuous focus on literacy, numeracy and health and well-being. Brian Whittle. Uh, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer and I wonder if he would agree with me that, that, that uh, skills like learning to swim or, or learning to cook a healthy meal or even access to uh, good physical education are all extremely important in ensuring our children develop into healthy active adults attaining all they can uh, and, and that school is the obvious place to deliver in these crucial skills. John Swinney. Uh, yes, I, I agree with uh, Mr Whittle's observations. I think all of these elements are essential parts of the experience of young people. Uh, there will be a, a breadth of opportunity that's available through uh, different schools in different parts of the country. Uh, there's an increasing focus on the uh, knowledge and appreciation of skills for work through the Developing Scotland Young Workforce Agenda, which has been a tremendous innovation over the last few years in response to the report from Sir Ian Wood. And some of the fundamental long-standing elements of our school system around um, the teaching of the skills to, uh, to cook or to swim or to be physically active uh, are all key parts of our curriculum which are deployed across our education system. Question number 11, Monica Lennon. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government how schools support children and young people who are affected by alcohol harm. John Swinney. Training officer, improving outcomes for children affected by parental substance misuse is a priority for the Scottish Government. We recognise the need to all work together with a range of partners to ensure children who live with substance misusing parents get the care and the support that they need. All staff in schools share responsibility for identifying the care and wellbeing needs of children and young people. Schools should establish open, positive, supporting relationships across the whole school community. This could include the provision of school-based counselling or support from pastoral care staff in these efforts. Monica Lennon. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his response. 51,000 children and young people in Scotland live with a problem drinker and we now have a better understanding than ever before uh, of alcohol harm in the context of adverse childhood experiences and its impact on, on long-term health. 
Um, Counselling is available, as we've heard, in some schools, but, but not in all. Doesn't the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that when one in 18 young people under the age of 16 are affected by alcohol harm, that access to school-based counselling should be a right and option that's open to all, and that it is an effective way of using preventive spend to help these young people, and in the year of the, the young person, what better time to deliver it? John Swinney. Fundamentally, I agree with Monica Lennon that there has to be a, a, a very clear focus within our policy making on the well-being of every child. That is central to curriculum for excellence. It's one of the three key elements that the Chief Inspector of Education highlighted in his guidance to the education system in August 2016, that alongside literacy and numeracy, well-being was central to the health and well-being was central to the curriculum. So that's available to every single young person as part of our curricular approach. Now, as I said in my answers, principally to Gail Ross earlier on uh, this afternoon, in every school there will be support available for young people. It will take different forms in different schools and be different arrangements. But fundamentally, all schools are obliged to follow the agenda of getting it right for every child. And if we follow a getting it right for every child approach, that means that we assess individually the requirements and the needs of every uh, young person and support them to overcome any challenges that uh, they may have. Now, the wider discussion around the impact of adverse childhood experiences is now much more significant within the policy debate. And I'm very optimistic that the steps that we're taking with the discussion that I, that I set out earlier on in my answer to Gail Ross it will have a constructive effect on focusing public services across the board on making sure that young people are able to attract the support that they require. Question number 12 has been withdrawn. So question 13, Ian Gray. <clears throat> to ask the Scottish Government whether it will comment on trends in spending on schools since 2010-11. John Swinney. Officer, funding to local authorities who are responsible for the delivery of education has been fair and is increasing despite continued UK government cuts to Scotland's budget. The total spending on education by author local authorities has increased from £4.9 billion in 2010-11 to £5.1 billion in 2016-17. This is a 4.5% increase in cash terms. Through this, government's local, this year's local government settlement, we're providing £112 million next year specifically to fund councils to maintain teacher numbers, including funding for the recent Teacher Pay Award. We're investing £179 million in 2018-19, up £9 million from last year, in raising attainment and closing the attainment gap, targeting the schools and local authorities who should benefit most. This funding contributes to our commitment to provide an extra £750 million for education through the Scottish Attainment Fund during the course of this Parliament. This investment in Scottish education has enabled a total of nearly 700 additional teachers to be recruited as at September 2017. Ian Gray. <clears throat> the Improvement Services' latest local benchmarking report has very detailed figures on spending uh, on education across Scotland uh, and paints a rather different picture from the Cabinet Secretary's. That report reveals that in both primary and secondary education, there has been a reduction in real terms and spend per pupil uh, in our schools. In primary schools, a, a real terms reduction of £513 per pupil, and in secondary schools, a real terms reduction of £205 per secondary pupil. Will the Cabinet Secretary not just admit that cuts of £1.5 billion to local government since 2011 have inevitably had a detri detrimental impact on our children's education. John Swinney. Um, what I will comment on is the fact that in very difficult and challenging economic times, where there has been significant constraint applied to the Scottish Government's budget, the investment in education has increased by 4.9%. Per now, that is the practical impact of the government wrestling with a difficult financial challenge and of course as a result of the local government settlement this year which Mr Gray voted against and the budget which Mr Gray voted against he voted against the extra money going in to support the Scottish attainment challenge to close the poverty related attainment gap and the Labour Party voted against every single measure of this type. So don't come here complaining to me about education spending when the Labour Party's voted against it. 
Question number 14, Rhoda Grant. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with the trade unions regarding the merger of UHI colleges. Shirley Ann Somerville. UHI had a constructive meeting with the relevant unions on the 6th of March and will continue to work with them. Initial discussions have taken place between the Scottish Funding Council and the unions as well. A further tripartite meeting between the UHI, unions and the Scottish Funding Council is currently being arranged. Rhoda Grant. The Minister is aware that college lecturers won a universal peace settlement this summer. Can I ask, will this be honoured if the FE lecturers are to be employed by a university? And can I also ask, is she aware of the locally rooted as well as world-renowned reputations of many of the partner colleges and how will that reputation, those reputations be protected under the new settlement? Shirley Ann Somerville. Well, I'll first begin my answer um, by highlighting that this uh, proposal for integration uh, is at a very early stage and further uh, details will be available in the summer of 2018. The reason the UHI partnership are, are looking to evolve in this way is to create a fully integrated curriculum and a more effective delivery of academic provision. But I do recognise that there are concerns, for example, um, around trade union representation, uh, trade union recognition um, and around national bargaining. That's exactly why um, I'm pleased that the discussions yesterday were constructive, uh, that it was the first of, I'm sure, many discussions involving the trade unions, UHI and the Funding Council. Uh, and I am also due to meet UHI uh, to discuss these issues. And we will go through in great detail the concerns that are being raised uh, by the trade unions, um, the views of students and the views of the local communities. Because I do take very seriously the point that the colleges that are involved in this and the, the other colleges within UHI are much valued within their local communities and provide um, a world-class service in their own right. Supplementary question to Tavish Scott. Thank you. I, I noticed the Minister mentioned the uh, other colleges and I hope she's aware that there's not been a lot of discussion, if indeed any at all, with the other colleges. I think there's a meeting today about that uh, very subject. Would, would, when she has those meetings with the, with the UHI, would she take that matter up uh, very directly uh, indeed? Is she also aware, of course, that Perth College have already said they may not wish to be part of this merger, not integration, but merger? And would she finally uh, recognise, as I'm sure she does, that the student experience, the learner-student experience is the most uh, important thing here? And and many of us are not convinced that yet another merger is the way to ach achieve better student experiences. Shirley Ann Somerville. Well, uh, the proposals are, as I say, at a very early stage, and Perth College will attend the integration board meetings um, as an observer. Uh, this doesn't involve all the colleges within UHI because uh, this is a process uh, which has came not from the government, not from the funding council, but from within UHI, looking specifically at the point that Tavish Scott quite rightly raises about what's right for the students, and I would also add uh, what would be right for the staff and the local communities that they serve. So we'll take very um, seriously the, the views of the students, uh, the staff, um, as well as those within the UHI implementation board. And I would include, obviously, within that, not just the colleges uh, that are involved in this process, uh, but UHI um, as a whole and every other college that's taking part as a partner um, organisation. Question number 15, Colin Smith. Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what changes it forecasts in the number of support for learning staff in schools in the next year. John Swinney. Presiding officer, the Additional Support for Learning Act places duties on education authorities to identify, provide support and review that support for the pupils. It is for education authorities to ensure that they have the appropriate resources, including support staff in place, to meet the needs of their pupils. Local government finance statistics for 2016-17 showed that local authorities spent £5.1 billion on education in Scotland, a 0.3% increase in real terms, 2.5% in cash terms. Of that, £610 million was on additional support for learning. This has increased from £584 million in 2015-16, a 2.3% increase in real terms and 4.5% in cash terms. Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. The number of learning support teachers fell by 12% between 2012 and 2016. And overall, additional support needs staff numbers fell by 3%. At a time, the number of students with additional support needs has risen 
by 55%. Does the Cabinet Secretary not take any responsibility for the fall in learning support staff? And does he ex accept that unless we see a reversal in the cuts in funding per student with additional needs that we've seen over the same period, we will fail to meet the needs of some of our most vulnerable children in the classroom? John Swinney. But the, the first point I'd make, and Mr Smith is very well aware of this point, is that the classifications that are used here and the recording of uh, students has changed very dramatically over the period. Uh, so uh, that has to be reflected on in this answer. Secondly, um, Mr Smith talks about the total number of staff supporting pupils with additional support needs. On well, the information I have in front of me, um, that has increased from 15,723 in 2011 to 15,880 in 2016, which by any stretch of the imagination is an increase. And also, I remind and repeat to Mr Smith the point I made in my original answer, that there has been a real terms increase in expenditure on additional support for learning in the last year for which information is available by 2.3% in real terms. That's a welcome investment, and I'm glad to see that being invested in supporting some of the most vulnerable young people in our society. That concludes portfolio questions, and we shall move on to the next item of business.